In a week of space news and updates like this week's, one would argue that an introduction to all of this awesome stuff is just sort of wasted time. Indeed, that may be true because, wow, there is so much to chat about today, friends. By now, you know the format anyway, right? Let's just get into it. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. <laughs> this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and kicking off right at SpaceX's Gateway to Mars site, yes, we have more new propellant tanks arriving early in the week. Two new horizontal tanks to be specific, both were delivered and rolled in behind the existing tank farm, and then moved into position on self-propelled modular transporters, setting them down nice and gently there on the already prepared pedestals. The tank farm sure is rapidly expanding now. With those two old custom-built vertical tanks removed the previous week, SpaceX seems to be just itching to take down the rest as soon as practical. It'll likely have to wait until after Flight 3, but I would expect to see the remaining oxygen and nitrogen tanks removed fairly soon after that. Those tall tanks are much more in the line of fire by debris as we've seen by the damage on them already. Not really a feature that you want your propellant supply system to have. I'm assuming that we'll eventually see enough horizontal tanks to store all of the required liquid oxygen, methane, nitrogen and water commodities needed. That way it's all shielded behind the berms here. Now, as an example of how problematic these old tanks have become now, SpaceX have begun installing massive I-beams spanning their full height. Certainly a big effort to strengthen them compared to what they tried to do on this converted water tank before it was scrapped. Now interestingly, nearby, over at the base of the huge launch tower, they've started to mark this out. It looks like the concrete here has taken a fair beating during all the testing up to this point. I wouldn't be surprised to see new concrete being poured, or perhaps even metal shielding being added in these areas exposed to the direct Raptor exhaust. Starship Gazer caught the first metal strips being installed there, together with this huge grid laying out the future plans. That is a neat visual of all of the holes already drilled in the extension for the drawworks. Moving up the orbital launch mount, they've started adding more heat shielding plates right next to the booster quick disconnect, actually just slapping these new ones right on top. The intense exhaust smashing into this area as the Starship pushes itself away from the tower at liftoff obviously requires some greater reinforcement. Back last year, Elon had mentioned installing a water-cooled steel jacket, so I'm still wondering if that will appear here at some point soon. Preparation for the next full-stack launch are well underway, I'd say. SpaceX closed the road this week for some testing of the tank farm. It started off kind of slow, but soon enough, the main purge vent on the huge tower erupted, spewing out quite the impressive cloud. That purge is a great way to ensure that any debris is hurled out rather than being accidentally tanked into a vehicle at some point. Another item on the launch checklist was this. The ship quick disconnect is fully back in action with the team performing multiple tests, even a full speed retraction as seen right here. Nearby, the iconic SpaceX crane was lowered this week, with them quickly then removing multiple parts. With all this going on, it doesn't look like we're going to see them doing any Ship 29 static fires anytime soon. Over at the build site, we left there last week, of course, bidding farewell to Tent 3 as the demolition was finalised. RGV aerial photography was up overhead right after, and check that out. It sure is an unusual view now that all of the iconic Starbase tents are gone. It is all for the best though. The footprint of the Star Factory is already ginormous, and there is even more room to extend into now. One of the new sections here is of course the part where we are really hoping to see an awesome glass side face, similar to the facilities that SpaceX already built over at Bastrop, Texas, where they produce their Starlink satellites. Nice view of that there by Joe Tegdemeyer too. It is, however, starting to look like this might not be fully integrated with the rest of the Star Factory. Look at this here. The face closest has this new siding and also a huge entrance added. We've also had a few good peaks inside, and it already looks like SpaceX is absolutely hammering out production of future Starship parts. As always, there were some movements in and out of the bays, starting with Booster 13's forward section moving into Mega Bay 1 on Tuesday. This is the section at the very top of the booster, sporting the methane tank dome and the grid fins. This obviously excludes the new addition of the separate hot staging cap, which comes later. The next segment that we usually see under this is a three ring tall section, and sure enough, this was ready to move into the mega bay with it. Both parts were lifted in one smooth movement onto the welding platform in the bay to fuse them together. 
Also in Mega Bay 1, the hot staging ring that belongs to Booster 10 was lifted off and moved out to the ring yard so that the team can get in there. They have, of course, plenty of time to tinker or improve things. Like Elon said, Starship Flight 3 is expected to launch in a few weeks sometime next month, so they may only be removing the ring to inspect the grid fin motors and all of the intricate mechanisms lying underneath. In this image, we can see Ship 28's lifting points being covered by heat tiles in the high bay. That is something else that we always see close to launch. With any luck, this ship will be completed and rolled out soon. Now quickly moving down to the Massey site, we've got some more intriguing activity. You may recall I mentioned last week that the new tank pedestals for cryogenic storage tanks were going to appear soon here. Well, those concrete pedestals were in the process of being poured soon after, and close by we can see the first of the cryogenic pipework heading towards the ship static fire stand, also being installed and integrated as we speak. While here at Massey's, Booster 12 conducted another cryogenic proofing test here early in the week. This time the liquid oxygen tank was filled almost all the way to the top, and the test once again lasted long into the night. That was all the testing that this booster needed at this location, so it was moved back towards the build site this week. Here it was, turning into the Sanchez site, and after a few minor delays, ended up parked in the rocket garden. Now after a little time to think about all that was said in Elon's presentation last week, and running over many questions that you all had for me, there is actually a lot to dive into. Last week we touched on his explanation of Ship 25's explosion before reaching orbit. Just to recap that, he said that the intentional liquid oxygen vent was the cause of the problem, kicking off a fire which then resulted in the vehicle exploding. But how exactly does a bunch of dumped oxygen start a fire? There needs to be an ignition source, and there needs to be fuel with the oxidizer to actually burn. Now we can probably assume that Raptor engine exhaust is the perfect source for ignition, but you would think that an excess fuel source and even an existing fire would be needed for the oxygen to just interact with it like this. I think that we are probably missing the other half of the story here the more I think about it. There must have been a situation where methane was leaking around the engine bay or something like that. We just don't know. I suspect the FAA and SpaceX mishap report will spread some more light on what exactly happened and how SpaceX is going to prevent that in in the future. Now there was also a really unexpected animation of the Starlink version 2 deployment here. It basically looked identical to the ones shown in the old presentation, but wait, the deployment door now splits into three parts. That is bizarre, so we're going to be looking around to see if new door prototypes start popping up that somehow match this weird looking system. Now another point from Elon's talk that I was quite interested in was this. We've got a, a version 3 ship uh, design that will stretch the that be even taller, <laughs> probably end up being, I don't know, 140 meters before it's all said and done, maybe 150 in the end. 140 to 150 meters? Well, we knew that they did want to stretch the full stack a little, but 150 meters is almost 30 meters taller than it is right now. That is going to look almost comical, and here is the current full stack, this beautiful 3D printed 1 to 200 scale starship by more than 3D. Much easier to use this to demonstrate something like this than the much larger one there in the background. So if we were to proportionally extend the stack, we can do this by, say, pulling the stack apart from maybe here, uh, and extending the full stack by about that same amount. That's the extra height that we're talking about there. Of course, I'm sure that they would stretch both the booster and the Starship stage, and the ship would grow like this. Now, we've got the talented Chameleon Circuit to show us what this would look like in real life. This is an early photo from SpaceX on their Flickr account. Oh man, do I wish that they would still publish images there. And then we have the new 3D render on top. Extending it out that far is going to take modifications on the tower for sure. The ship quick disconnect would need to move up a lot at that point, meaning some pretty big changes. Not to mention that the tower arms would need to be raised a lot higher than what it is capable of currently. I think it's going to be interesting to see if they build the new tower down here quite a lot higher for version 3. Now you can pick up the 3D files to print these by yourself from the website, or you can of course order the full models, and you know, they're just really cool. They just snap on and off there together with magnets. It's just so easy. Thanks to everybody that supports what Arn does there at morethan3d.com, they get to make this magic simply because of you. Critical for them, just as it is for us with you awesome subscribers and supporters of what we do. Just so thrilled that I get to be part of such a fantastic community like this. Now one final point in Elon's presentation, which isn't so much Starship related, but still exciting, is Polaris Dawn. He confirmed that this year they still do expect that mission to launch. We get a great double whammy with this mission. First, it's heading into a 
much higher orbit than usual, and also it'll be using the first ever SpaceX spacesuit for the spacewalk and the crew that will remain inside the Dragon in a vacuum. Both of those very critical boxes are vital for SpaceX to tick off before they're venturing all the way to the Moon's surface. With a bunch of delays already on this mission, I'm just so excited to see it. It'll be one of the big missions of this year for sure. Right, so speaking of Crew Dragon, the mission of the week of course has got to be Axiom 3, launching only around 7 months or so after the second Axiom 2 mission. Before the launch, the crew had geared up all ready for their thrilling ride to the ISS on board SpaceX's Falcon 9. I have had a bunch of questions lately asking if it would launch from the new Crew Access Tower at Sleek 40, but no, this one was also from Pad 39A, but yeah, we'll see Sleek 40 action soon enough I'm sure. The commander of this mission, former NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria. He also commanded the first Axiom mission and has an extensive career with five previous missions, including 10 spacewalks. That's a whole lot of experience to guide this new crew through the ins and outs of such a mission. The pilot for the mission from Italy is Colonel Walter Villaday of the Italian Air Force, and if you recall, he was also part of Virgin Galactic's first fully commercial VSS Unity flight last year, so that has surely been a unique experience flying on both these commercial missions. We have mission specialist Marcus Wand, the first ESA astronaut to be on board an Axiom mission, and finally Alpa Gezevedarci, the first Turkish astronaut to go to space. As a neat little part of their training, the crew were taught how to use these supplied cameras to take professional images. Those skills are important for all of us down here of course, because then we get to enjoy some of those sweet shots sent home. Now the lead up to this launch was intense, and the liftoff itself was, as all crewed missions tend to be, a very scenic one. A brilliant view of the Falcon 9 booster 1080 lifting off with the Crew Dragon Freedom on top. That is the third time that this Crew Dragon has been to orbit now. It was all streamed by NASA at higher quality than SpaceX's version on Twitter, so we got a really nice view of the return to landing site for the booster there. That last leg seemed to pop out just a little late there, didn't it? For just a second, I thought we might have a problem. Anyway, soon after the glorious shot of the Dragon drifting away, and the nose cone swung open to uncover the docking port just under 20 minutes into the mission. Now one thing that I thought was really interesting about this trip to the space station is that it was to take 36 hours. That is one heck of a long time. Excluding Inspiration 4, which obviously didn't go to the station, no other Crew Dragon mission has taken near that. The crew should actually be docking at almost the same time as this video goes live. They will make the ISS their home for the next 14 days, doing all kinds of great experiments and fun science. This week, Starlink launches were crazy again with more back-to-back -back launches. Firstly, Group 710 launched on Sunday the 14th of January from Vandenberg, California. It was the 18th flight there for Falcon 9 Booster 1061, which is now the current active reuse leader since 1058 came home broken in half. Across the country, just the next day, Group 637 was also on its way from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral. Now, SpaceX's Starlink network in general seems to make headlines every week these days. Recently, of course, they successfully managed to send text messages using the prototype direct to sell service, launched only six days after their first flight to orbit. The craziest thing to me is that it's actually possible for a mobile phone with standard tech to communicate with a satellite that's 500 kilometers away. Not only that, I suppose it's kind of like connecting to a fast moving cell tower screaming overhead. With T-Mobile's network and other global partners, this is one step closer to global cell service no matter where you are on the surface of the planet. You've just got to love those weird text messages sent there. In typical SpaceX fashion, indeed, such signal, much wow. Now, if you look closely, there are some missing messages or differences in the order, but with only a few satellites in orbit, there is a long, long way to go before the network is able to be speedier and reliable. Pretty cool though what can be done just with a mobile phone without a dish needed or anything like that. Speaking of dishes, Elon also revealed that we could also be seeing a portable Starlink dish. Yes, a Starlink mini dish was approved by the FCC a few months ago now. This is apparently small enough to fit in a backpack about the size of a laptop or something like that. That would be incredibly useful for people on the move, and it's amazing seeing the equipment like this being adopted already. On top of that, SpaceX have also signed a deal just recently with John Deere, the monster in farming machinery. Their SATCOM solution here is going to connect both new and existing machines through a satellite internet service and 
and ruggedized Starlink terminals. It should all enable much better autonomy and real-time data is going to play a great role even allowing a game-changing remote diagnostics to help farmers more efficiently work while minimizing their downtime. That should initially be available via a limited release in the US and Brazil, kicking off in the second half of 2024. So yes, finalizing this one, the boosters from both those missions touched down on the drone ships there in the darkness, always awesome to see. Now, some updates on Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander and its ultimate fate as the situation has developed. Before we dive into that, a big shout out to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. Ever feel like your online privacy is under threat or frustrated by geographically blocked content? Well, say hello to Surfshark VPN, your digital shield and the key to restricted content. While a significant portion of the internet is already encrypted, what often goes unencrypted are the logs of your online activities, revealing what you're browsing and when. With Surfshark VPN, all of your online actions are channeled through their secure connection, not your internet service providers. This becomes absolutely crucial, especially if you are using someone else's network, such as public Wi-Fi. In that situation, the last thing that you want is hackers lurking nearby, potentially intercepting plain text passwords and sensitive data. If geo restrictions are dampening your streaming or news browsing experience, Surfshark VPN is your master key to bypassing those restrictions. In just seconds, you can switch to a point within whatever country you choose. With a simple connection, you are all set to binge watch international shows, access restricted news, and stay connected with loved ones no matter where they are in the world. The cherry on top is that one subscription lets you protect an unlimited number of devices simultaneously. Are you ready to take control of your online experience? Well, check it out with a 30-day money-back guarantee by heading to surfshark.deals Marcus and use code Marcus to get up to six additional months for free. Thank you, Surfshark. So yes, back to Astrobotic, the Peregrine lander which launched on the first flight of Vulcan the week prior, many of you had loads of questions about. Now, as we know, there was a faulty valve on the spacecraft leaking propellant, and it had quickly become clear that a moon landing was impossible. Now, the teams thought about operating this as a longer-term spacecraft, which would orbit the moon eventually. Over time, though, it was found that this wasn't practical. Interestingly, from one of the more recent updates, it seemed that the leak had pretty much completely sealed itself off, so it's a shame that this mission hasn't been able to continue. Earlier in the week, Astrobotic were facing the tough call of how to gracefully end this mission. After consulting with NASA, the decision was to simply allow it to fall back to the Earth and simply let it burn up in the atmosphere. This would avoid it making a mess in orbits between the Earth and the Moon. That has now re-entered just the other day, burning up as predicted. A bit of a sad ending there. I was hoping perhaps they could fire up the engines with the remaining propellant and have it ending up in a heliocentric orbit, but I guess that would have ended unpredictably and potentially kick off another brand new leak. Still, Astrobotic have learned a lot and they've been able to do some pretty amazing things with a pretty leaky spacecraft. Speaking of lunar landers, hopefully you remember the slim Japanese lunar lander that started its journey to the moon about four months ago. Well, it has finally made its landing attempt just yesterday. Now, it took a relatively long path from Earth, finally getting into orbit around the moon at the end of December. Watching the landing attempt, though, that was nail-biting. JAXA was trying to land slim in a zone of less than 100 meters, so if everything actually went to plan, it would be the most precise landing on the moon ever. This was really exciting to watch with everything looking great. Right before the landing, Slim kicked out the two small lunar rovers that it was carrying, and then kicked off this unique touchdown where it simply tips over and falls down on these shock absorbent legs placed on the other side. The great news is that it touched down and began sending data, so success in that regard. But for reasons that were still breaking at the time, it was not generating any power. The immediate thoughts are that it perhaps rolled over or that its landing location ended up out of direct sunlight, but check out the latest news feeds on that when you get a second because, yeah, as I say, the news was just breaking. I think it is wonderful though that the soft landing on the moon was at least partially successful. Now NASA and Lockheed Martin have finally unveiled the X-59 experimental supersonic aircraft, which I think is a pretty astounding sight given how unusual it looks. We've talked about the X-59 before, of course, but it was still in the early development phase. But finally, it is ready to take the first test flight. NASA's Quest mission is designed to fly at 1.4 times the speed of sound, around 925 miles per hour 
all while minimising the sonic disruptions that usually comes from vehicles breaking the sound barrier. This presentation was held at Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works in Palmdale. For all of the spaceflight enthusiasts, you may wonder why I think that this is so interesting. Well, with this project, I think the X-59 is more than just an aircraft. To me, supersonic flight is a kind of sweet middle ground blurring the boundaries between the air travel and the space travel that we all watch so closely. Now, as we know from history around the Concorde, commercial supersonic flight over land has been restricted pretty heavily due to the loud sonic booms that are experienced by everybody below. The X-59, however, has this innovative design that aims to address this issue with the sleek shape, which includes that long, thin, tapered nose, and an engine mounted on the top with an exhaust deck to minimise the shockwaves from merging. Now, on this demo vehicle, there are no forward-facing windows, so the test pilot needs to rely simply on external vision systems consisting of high-resolution cameras and monitors to provide that unobstructed view. Next up, there will be a series of integrated system tests, engine runs, and taxi testing, and then the first flights should happen later this year. The idea is to fly the X-59 over a number of US cities to gather public feedback on its sonic impact. Rather than the thunderous boom, we hope that the sonic booms produced by this aircraft would be no louder than a car door being slammed nearby. This data will be vital for the FAA and the international regulators to see if they can begin relaxing the restrictions around supersonic travel over populated areas. I really hope that we will once again start to see a new era in aviation, a time again where we can travel faster than the speed of sound comfortably with a variety of consumer aircraft. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. If you want to continue with more space goodness, the algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these videos. Thanks again for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.